what I thought I would attempt to do in this and the next few videos is just to give a scaffold of American history. I'm clearly going to uh, glaze over a lot of the details, but hopefully it'll give you a sense of how everything at least fits together, at least the major events in American history. So you can kind of, and when I say American history, I'm talking about United States history. And so the first real successful settlement in what's now the United States was at Jamestown, and that's Jamestown, Virginia right over here, and it was 1607. It was set up as kind of a commercial settlement. And then shortly after that, and we always learn this in uh, in school, you know, the pilgrims on the Mayflower uh, sailing the oceans blue and all the rest, they were kind of the next major settlement in, in the New World, or I guess we should say the next major successful English settlement. There were obviously the Spanish and the Portuguese were already settling the, the New World with, with, with a good bit of success at this point, but we're talking about the English settlements. And so the pilgrims settled Plymouth, what's now Plymouth, Massachusetts, in 1620. And at, obviously, from 1620 until the mid 1700s, you just had a huge influx of people migrating and cities developing. But I'm going to fast forward all the way to the mid 1700s. So this is actually a huge amount of time that I'm I'm just not providing any details over, because I'm really just going focused on the major events in American history. And so this is a 130 year period where things were just getting built out more. They were getting more developed. And I'm going to fast forward to 1754, because at this period, you had essentially the entire east coast of what's now the US. These were the 13 colonies of the United, of, well, they're not the United States yet. They're the 13 British colonies. But these are English settlements. And then if you go a little bit to the northwest from there, you have all of the French settlements. And obviously, still in these parts of, you know, in Quebec and Canada, people speak French. But you had the French settlements up in this area, up in this area over here. And I'm, I'm not going to go to the details. Each of these can be a whole series of videos, and hopefully in the future, I will make them whole series of videos. But you fast forward to 1754, and you start having the French and the British start getting into squabbles on over territory where Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania is right now in 1754. And that starts the French and Indian War. And I want to be very clear here, because this is one of maybe one of the biggest points of confusion when people first learn American history. Since it's called the French and Indian War, they think it's between the French and the Indians. But it's not. It was the French and the Indians against against the British against the British and the colonists. So in this war, the British and the colonists were on the same side against the French and the Indians. And obviously, there were some Indians that were also on the side of the British. But, but it, it's called the French and Indian War because these were the people that the British were fighting against. Now, if anyone outside of the, the United States talks about the French and Indian War, they will not call it the French and Indian War. They'll really just call that the American theater of the Seven Years' War, because it eventually evolves into a much bigger conflict between Great Britain and France that's going on in Europe. And the French and Indian War was really just the American theater of it. So between between seven, the French and Indian War starts in 1754 based on these disputes over Pittsburgh, but that wasn't the only thing. You had all of these other things that, all of these other um, tensions that were developing. The, the the thing that starts the war is never the only factor. There's all it's always just the tipping point. But that leads to a bigger uh, a bigger war in Europe, and that's the Seven Years' War that starts in 1756 and ends. They both end because they're really the same war. They're really the same war. They both end in 1763 with the Treaty of Paris. Treaty of Paris, 1763. And the big takeaway of that is that really most of what France had in the New World now becomes a now becomes essentially a, a part of the British Empire. Now becomes British colonies or British territories. And even Louisiana goes over to Spain at this point, and we'll see it goes back to France for a little bit in 1800, and then it goes back to the United States in 1803. But we'll see that in a second. So 1763, the British, it was this huge, costly war, but they were able to win. And at least from the point of view of the British, they felt that this, you know, the main beneficiaries of this war were the Americans. They were able to get all of this new territory, all of this new area that they can now trade with, or they can now potentially uh, settle. And so the British decide to 
start taxing the Americans for at least some portion to, to recoup some portion of the cost of the war. So they passed in 1765, they passed the Stamp Act. And this wasn't a, uh, this wasn't a tax on stamps. What this was is that they essentially declared that a whole set of paper that had to be used in the new world, so uh, the stuff that for legal documents, stuff that uh, maybe even newspaper, that that paper would have to be produced in, in Great Britain. And it had to have a special stamp on it in order for the the contracts or whatever was on top of it in order for them to be legitimate. So it essentially was a huge tax on paper and on documents. And essentially, this is what uh, kind of societies ran on. So it was just a way to extract money from the colonists uh, in order to I guess help pay back some of the the cost that that the uh, the empire felt that they had incurred on behalf of the colonists. You could debate whether who was the main beneficiary, but but regardless, you could imagine this this didn't make this whole period over here. The colonists weren't happy, especially because they didn't have any representation in parliament. This was done without anybody from from uh, from the colonies saying, "Hey, wait, I don't think that's fair. Or, this is fair, or whatever." And so you fast forward 1773, you have the Boston Tea Party, where you have a bunch of people who, for whatever reason, and there's there's multiple interests here, but there was three ships in Boston Harbor full of tea, uh, and and owned by the the tea was owned by the East India Tea Company, and they decide in protest, and there was a whole there there was a whole series of acts and and other taxes that went back and forth. But once again, we're not going to go into the details here. But in in revolt, they dumped the tea. They dressed up as Indians, as American Indians, and they dumped the tea into Boston Harbor. And then you can imagine, uh, well, well, you know, that was kind of a very exciting act for the colonists. But it was a very, uh, it, it didn't make the British very happy. And then after that, they passed the Coercive Acts. They essentially did a blockade of Boston. So things started to get really, really, really tense in the early 1770s. And then you fast forward to 1775. You have essentially the first conflicts of the American Revolutionary War, and we're going to do a whole series of videos on really the whole Revolutionary War. 1776, you have the the Declaration of Independence. This is them right here drafting the Declaration of Independence, and that's really just saying, hey, you know, we've had enough of you. Uh, we've had enough of you, Great Britain. We are now declaring ourselves as an independent country. No more of this. No more of this colonies business. And so, all the way until 17. 17- 83 you have the American Revolutionary War and once again you can do a lot of videos on this but I'm just going to uh, go over it just so you have a, a sense of when everything happened and when everything ended and we can later dig deeper into the scaffold and it ends with the Treaty of Paris the US becomes a free uh, a free independent state and then you fast forward until this point we are the US is being governed by Congress and the Articles of Confederation but the constitution that we have now it was drafted in 1787 it was ratified it had to get at least 9 of the states to ratify it that happened in 1788 and then it went into effect in 1789 so it depends what you consider the birth of the country it well it was definitely be the declaration of independence but the country in its current form with its current institutions with its current constitution started in 1789 and that was also the beginning of washington's first of two terms as president and those ended in 17 97 and then John Adams comes into the picture. And the reason why I put this, I won't obviously this is actually the only president that I showed is that it was actually very important that he decided to step down after two terms. He was hugely popular. If he wanted to, he probably could have become one of these characters that stick around uh, uh, maybe a little bit longer than some people would want. So it was really good that he set this example of stepping down after two terms and that he wasn't this kind of power hungry dude. You fast forward a little bit more, 1803. I mentioned that after the after the French and Indian War, uh, what's Louisiana? I want to be clear when I say Louisiana. Louisiana isn't just what's the current state of Louisiana. It's this whole region that includes the state of Louisiana, but all the way up to roughly what are the the U- United States' current border with Canada. And after the French and Indian War, all of this business over here went to Spain, and then in 1800 it went back to France. But then in 1803, Napoleon had a bunch of stuff that he had to wear. His naval fleet was destroyed. He had a uh, he had suffered some defeats in 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 the in the West Indies, I guess we could call it. Um, 
in particular in 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 in, in Haiti and uh, he said well you know I probably won't be able to control this territory anyway so he sold it to the United States for uh, what turned out to be a very 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 cheap price but it was kind of like you know it's not like he could have protected it anyway the United States might have been able to take it from him without him being able to do anything so he might as well get some money uh, uh, for it so that he could fund his battles in Europe so in 1803 the United States almost doubled in size it went from it went from these territories that it had after the American after the American Revolution for Independence, and now it got all of this region over here in 1803. Then you fast forward a bit, you fast forward a bit, and the War of 1812. It's an interesting one because there weren't any really serious um, outcomes from it. But what was interesting about it this whole this whole time period, even after independence. The British continued to harass America. They continued to uh, arm uh, Native Americans who who would uh, who would cause uh, kind of you know who would maybe revolt or or cause trouble for settlers. They would impress uh, American seamen. And when I say impress, it didn't mean that they were like you know doing something special. It meant that they were the impressment of 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 seamen meant that they were kind of taking over these boats, taking the sailors, and forcing them to become part of uh, the British military. So they were doing a whole series of things that was really kind of antagonizing the United States. In 1812, the United States declares war on Great Britain. You have the War of 1812. It ends in 1815 with the Battle of New Orleans. Battle of New Orleans. But there wasn't any real transfer of uh, a territory or anything like that over here. What was good, some people call it the Second War for American Independence, is it really asserted that uh, kind of America's, that, that America was here to stay, or that I should say that the United States was here to stay. That the that the revolution wasn't just some fluke that it isn't some just fly by night country. It was able to defeat one of the greatest empires in the world again. So it's kind of here to stay. Now you fast forward a little bit more. The this part of of what we call Texas, this area right over here, it was before 1836. It was part of Mexico, but the Mexicans actually encouraged actually encouraged uh, English-speaking settlers. These would be American English-speaking settlers into the area, just because it was very sparsely settled. But these, these, these English-speaking settlers, a lot of them were slave owners. And then as we kind of go up to 1836, the state of Mexico that this was all kind of governed by, they were thinking about uh, ab abolishing slavery. So you could imagine that the, the settlers there, they didn't like this idea. So in 1836, you had the War for Texas Independence. And they were, you know, and that's where you remember, you remember the Alamo and all of that. And then the first president of Texas is Sam Houston. That's why Houston is named Houston. And then you fast forward all the way to 1845. And in this time period, you have this whole talk in the United States of manifest destiny, that you know it's, it's, it's part of our God-given destiny as, as Americans to one day uh, extend our territory all the, way to the, all the way to the Pacific Ocean. So people were already eyeing a lot of the territory. Remember, all of this territory, this was, this is, this was Texas. And Mexico still viewed it as their territory, even though it was being governed independently by the people who call themselves the Republic of Texas. And he had all of this territory that was Mexican territory. So people were starting to eye this as, hey, wouldn't it be nice uh, to get a little bit of that? So in 1845, and this was in agreement with the settlers in Texas, with the Republic of Texas, it, the United States annexed Texas. The settlers there wanted this to happen. So it wasn't a forced annexation of Texas. But Mexico was not so happy about this, because Mexico still viewed still viewed Texas as part of their territory. And America, to some degree, depends on how you view it. It seems like they kind of wanted to goad Mexico into war, so they sent military really close to the border of Mexico, even into some territory where you know Mexico might have had better claims to it. Or you know, I'm not going to take sides on this. But it seemed like there was some instigation going on, and there's some debate about the actual course of events. But in 1846, you have war actually breaking out between Mexico and the United States. And by 1848, the United States essentially trounces Mexico. And most of the war actually does go on on Mexican land, on Mexican land. And because of that, because of that, Mexico seeds over all of this area. So California and all of the rest of you know Nevada, Arizona, what the part of New Mexico that didn't come along with that the United States didn't already have. And along that those that same amount of time, 
you both had the British and the Americans that were that were eyeing this territory, the Oregon Territory up here, and it even included part of Canada. And eventually, they were able to resolve it relatively uh, peacefully. And what they agreed is is that the Americans would get all of this territory, and that the British would get everything north of this line right over here. And that's why Vancouver and uh, British Columbia and all of that is is Canada now. Uh, it stayed as part of the British Empire for a little bit longer. So by 1848, the Manifest Destiny essentially had happened. We, uh, the United States, had gotten everything from California all the way from the Pacific Coast to the Atlantic Coast, and then, you know, and clearly, I'm really co just covering the the high levels, just 30,000 level a, a foot view of American history here. This whole time, you had this tension developing, you know, from the birth of the country through. Through the election of Abraham Lincoln, you have this tension over slavery. A lot of people in the North didn't like it on moral grounds. Uh, a lot of people in the South didn't like it. Uh, well, they wanted slavery regardless of their their what they thought of it morally. The the South's economy, to a large degree, was based on on a slavery. And so all of this, you know, the tipping point kind of happened in 1860, where Abraham Lincoln, who was who was pretty vocal about his uh, about the fact that he did not like slavery, that he did he didn't he wanted to curb the spread of slave states, and you know up to this point he had all of these compromises. Every time a state came into the union, the slave states wanted to be another slave state, the free states wanted to be another free state. So you always had this uh, people kind of jockeying for 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 whoever could have the most states in in the, on their side of the camp. But all of this kind of uh, a, a pro-slavery and anti-slavery that hit a tipping point in, in 1860 when Abraham Lincoln, who was fairly vocal uh, about not extending slavery, he was elected. Then a bunch of what are now, you know, we can now consider southern states seceded from the union. And then in 1861 in in South Carolina, you know, South Carolina said, hey, we are not part of the United States anymore, but there was still a United States military garrison there, so they attacked it. That started the Civil War. And so during the Civil War, it lasts until 1865, Abraham Lincoln makes the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, which essentially proclaims all the slaves should be free. This lays the groundwork for uh, the 13th Amendment to the Constitution. And then, unfortunately, uh, he dies two months before the end of the Civil War. But in 1865, the South surrenders, and so they're not able to secede. And for essentially, we no longer have slavery in the United States. So I'm going to leave, and, and you know, it, it's fascinating. And just to give you a sense of things, here is the map. The, the navy blue are the Union states, the northern states. The light blue are the territory controlled by the northern states. This orange color are the, are the states that seceded from the Union, the Confederacy. And the, this light orange, these are kind of territories that they controlled, but they were disputed. And these yellow, these yellow states right here were, were members of the Union. They didn't secede from the Union. They didn't join the Confederacy, but they were slave states. But probably the most fascinating thing about uh, the, Amer the Civil War, other than the fact that it, it, it ended slavery in the United States, so that was probably its biggest thing, but it was also the bloodiest war that ever happened uh, in, United, in the United States history. During the Civil War, during the Civil War, and these are unbelievable numbers, 18% of white males in the South white males in the south in south died 18% almost one out of every 5 white males in the south died during the civil war and for the north it was slightly better it was 6% but still a huge percentage of of the men in these in the in, in the united states died fighting the civil war